Okay, recording on it. Record your... Okay. Anyway, so, hello everyone. This is my first ever podcast in a series of podcasts that I'm doing because I want to make money like Joe Rogan. Um, I'm here with my good friend from Hong Kong, uh, Vivek Mabubani. Uh, he's a fellow comedian. Uh, we met, I think, when did we meet? Uh, first meet uh, Vivek? 2011, 12? Uh, I think 2011. I think I came to Singapore. Okay. I think we met at some Singapore festival. We probably met over there. No, no, no. Kings and Queens, right? Right, Kings and yes. Kings of Comedy Asia. When I first came down to KL to do shows there, and yes. I think that's where we met. And um, he came up to me and he said, like, one day I wish I could do what you're doing. <laughs> and I was like, you won't. Till today, <laughs> you can keep wishing. <laughs> no, I think it was 2011, you came down for Kings and Queens. Yeah. Uh, and then <laughs> I remember that one of the, the funniest jokes you did was, okay, you, you performed in Cantonese, one bit in Cantonese that was really good. And then you did a joke about how, like, uh, you checked in your deodorant. Oh, or the Deodorant. Yes, checked in my deodorant can at Singapore Airport because I had it in my hand luggage. And right. the guy at the security was like, no, you can't take it on the plane. And I was like, dude, you're Indian. You understand our pain, man. And he was like, no, you still can't. And I was like, I'm going to check in one can of deodorant. And then, of course, I arrive in Hong Kong and everyone's waiting for their suitcase. And I'm waiting for the one can of deodorant coming down the luggage belt going like, eh, eh. <laughs> I look stupid, but I smelled great. It's amazing how uh, the joke still is not as funny. <laughs> yeah, that's because you're not my target audience I prefer exactly. people with intellect yes I remember um, so that was the, that was when I first saw you and first watched you live but I think um, it was the next year when you came for another show and then uh, I remember saying hey Vivek uh, let, let me take you out for lunch so I drove to Tune Hotel picked you up and then we ended up just driving around in circles talking about comedy talking about uh, yeah. life as a comedian I remember I remember because like we were still kind of newbies, you would say, you know, compared to at least today. We were like newbies. We were just excited about the whole journey and how we're discovering from just an audience member watching it like on videos to like, oh my goodness, I'm actually saying stupid stuff and people are actually listening to me. This is crazy. Yeah, I remember we had like a long, long, long talk. And it was it, it, from then on, um, what has happened is uh, I, I started doing my own solo tours and uh, one of the places I went to perform was in Hong Kong. Uh, so Vivek helped me a lot in uh, producing my shows and um, for the first time we did my live show we packed out uh, the entire place uh, it was really yeah. great 200 something people right yeah sorry we did two solo shows which uh, you helped me uh, pack out and then uh, we produced a MECC show where there's four of us uh, this was late last year and I remember the atmosphere was really different then because it was so hard to get even Malaysians coming out because the, the, the protests were going on and they were fear-mongering all around. Like, oh, you, if you go out, the apocalypse will happen. And I remember feeling really upset and annoyed because the show was great. The people who came had a good time, but we, we, we could have added easily another 100 people if not for, how to say, uh, the fear. Like, the, the, yeah. the atmosphere. Mm, you know, people having mm. this weird mood. Right. And uh, so, I mean, and the thing is, uh, because I know you and uh, I, I end up reading a lot about the Hong Kong protests and stuff like that. So, uh, I feel like I know a little bit more about these things as opposed to my friends. And I remember we had, a, I was going out with my friends uh, for dinner and then we ended up having a very heated argument. Even the manager had to come and say, uh, guys, is everything okay? <laughs> and, I, and, and I remember being the only one who was sort of like, saying, hey, they have a right to protest. Whereas the, my other friends were like, oh, no, 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 they're, what they're doing is wrong or whatever. How, how did it all start uh, since you've been in Hong Kong all this while? Actually, what you're encountering is something I encounter like quite often as well, depending on who I meet. Because what I always find is that people have different opinions, not based on their personality or you know, their, their social status, but more like when did they start getting involved in finding out information about the protest? It's kind of oh. like you know, when you read a book, and mm -hmm. someone says, this book, this book is great. And then someone else comes and reads the book from chapter four onwards and says, oh, the book is average. Then you start mm. reading the chapter from I mean, chapter 20 and you're like, this, the, the book makes no sense. It's like you don't come watch a comedy show and, and you're late. And then your comedian does the punchline. You're like, this is stupid. This, mm. this, guy, this guy is not funny. So what I always try to find is that when I talk to people and if they have different opinions to me, I try to understand when did you start getting involved in this? And what you will find is that this all began... You would say the biggest thing began basically in June last year when our chief executive tried to introduce the extradition bill and people were against it. It was, it was like the biggest thing of like, oh my goodness, this cannot happen, guys. We cannot agree to this idea. 
that you know if we commit a crime here in Hong Kong, that they can actually extradite us back to mainland China because people in Hong Kong generally don't have much confidence in the judicial system in mainland China, along with mm-hmm. a lot of businesses and everything. That's why Hong Kong has that special status. Now, so June 9th, people were like, Let's get, we're going to have a rally. We're going to come out and protest. And that was huge. A million people in Hong Kong in the summer heat came out and took to the streets. Hong Kong is made up yes. of 7.6 million people. <laughs> That's and crazy. A million people came up, right? That's oh unheard God. of. Right? Unheard of. It right. was it was ridiculous because, like, first of all, in Hong Kong, we have no time for even being polite and saying, hello, how are you? <laughs> and we're coming out to protest, right? So it all began. Yeah. Oh, oh, this shook my camera. I was that, that angry, that angry about the protest. <laughs> I had to shake my camera a bit. So uh, it all began from there. And then what was funny is that a million people came out, right? So one million out of 7.6 million people came out. And that very night, the chief executive issued a statement to say, oh, yeah. You guys came out. That's great. But we're going to go on with the uh, second reading and the bill will pass this Wednesday. And that was mm-hmm. like, what? Because like when, when I was there with the million people, I was like, this is it. We did it. This mm-hmm. is huge. I've never seen this many people on the streets. We were mm-hmm. all feeling good. Then right. the evening came around 11 something. The statement came out and that's when everything flipped. Everyone right. was just like, like, how is she ignoring this? Right. And that's where it all started getting dirty. Then the mm-hmm. 12th of June was when they were supposed to pass the bill. Or at least had the second reading. And the whole community went out and surrounded the legislative council, which we call LegCo, and mm-hmm. basically blocked the members from getting in to vote on this bill and successfully stopped it. But then the police took it to another level, tear gassing, right. just chaos, like people in corners and tear gassing them in the corners. There was an uh. incident on film, you know, and people were like trapped. Like basically the idea of tear gas is they're trying to disperse, disperse. the crowds, right? Yeah, disperse the crowd, not get them in the corner and gas them. You know, mm. and this is not World War II, dude. So <laughs> that's, what, that's what happened. So that's, that's where it all triggered. And then 16th of June, 2 million people came out. My I'm God. It's... And then it just escalated. Like there's a long story, but those are the beginnings. And right. usually when I talk to people and I'm like, did you go to any one of the 1 million or 2 million people protests? Usually the people who are against this didn't, which I, fair enough, maybe you liked the bill, but then... Uh, the idea is that you've never been to a rally and you, all you see is the news and you're like, oh, that one guy hit this guy at the rally. I'm like, there were 2 million people. Right. One guy got injured. And you're going to oh, tell me the yeah. whole rally is dirty? Okay, all right. Let's and of course, the, uh, the media is obviously either state control or it's one-sided. It has its own bias and agendas, right? Yes, correct. I mean, I, we have to be very fair. At whatever media it is, there's certain bias that will come in, which is why Hong Kong is so strange because we're watching the videos on live on Facebook. Everyone's watching what's going on live for themselves, not the yep. media reporting what happened. It's like we're watching it live, mm. which is ironic because like we'll watch the incident. Let's say we'll watch um, something happen today at 3 p.m. And then maybe in the evening, the police will come <laughs> out with their version of what <laughs> happened when right. everyone's like, we saw everything already. You can tell yeah. us like, oh, but this happened. It's like, no, we saw it live. All right. right. It, so it, people were not going by the news bias. It all sounds like a... a, a how to say it's like a Carrie Lam and uh, Carrie Lam and her her team they they don't know how to handle the PR uh, fallout of such a crisis right right I mean isn't this like a really bad PR thing it's kind of like you know a comedian going on stage and kind of getting heckled and then basically saying oh get the bouncer to throw the heckler out but actually the guy was heckling saying hey keep going you know you can do it come on you weren't getting any laughs but you just didn't like the idea you don't heckle me I'm not getting mm. laughs. doesn't matter. You don't heckle. I'm like, no, I was cheering you on. I heard that that's a heckle. You're out of here, you know? Right, right, right. I see. The, 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 the thing that really uh, attracted me uh, to all this, the, the Hong Kong protest was like, uh, Malaysia gone through a similar process, uh, al- although not as intense as Hong Kong where you guys protested almost every day. Uh, but I remember one of the big images, uh, Malaysians like to call it their political awakening. Like, whoever's active on social media about politics now, they always point to, I think it was in 2008 or before there was a, a uh, no, after 2008, there was like a big protest called the Berse Rally. Uh, Berse, is, Berse means clean and uh, the official color is yellow, by the way. <laughs> and they were, they were asking for free and fair elections, right? Free and fair elections, but a, a massive amount of people came out and same thing happened. The police came uh, water cannon, tear gas. And then because of that, you, you have photos of like old women being harassed, uh, the, the people in, pol- in uniforms beating down 
chasing down and beating down people. Then you have like, you know, the water cannon coming and spraying uh, people. So it gave like such a bad image of Malaysia. Al Jazeera picked it up. You can see like uh, a lot, all, all the Indian guys sit, seated down and the water cannon still being sprayed on them, right? So, but thanks to all these kind of, uh, there was Bursi 2, 3, 4 and onwards. Um, luckily, uh, because of that, um, on uh, 9th of May 2018, we managed to change the government. Uh, and, and, and so when I speak up in defense of the Hong Kong protest, I say, look, they have a right to protest because who knows, maybe down the line something good will happen, right? But there are some Malaysians and Singaporeans, by the way, Singaporeans are dead set against any form of protest. They're like, yeah, why are you yeah. doing this to destroy the, uh, why are you doing this to disrupt the lives of people and making, making a chaos? But see, that's the point. We have to, if a message is meant or worthy of being put out, it has to be disruptive. Not, if not, no one's going to listen. You know what's ironic? Like, if you look at any startups and, you know, pitching events and everything, they're always like, you know, disruptive, you know, the new disruptive idea that's going to change the industry. Disruptive is actually a very positive word in the world of startups and, you know, new innovations. But yet, the moment you bring it into general life, you're like, oh, don't disrupt what we like. You know, this is what we do. You stop disrupting everything. But like you said, disruption is going to happen with change. I mean, puberty sucks. We'd much mm. rather be the way we were, but it's going to have to happen. And, you know, you get through that and you become an adult and then you can do what you need to do. So, yeah, yeah. disruption is like, it, it's such a weird thing as in like, I hate it when it rains outside. So now, you know what? I'm going to be gloomy and just hate the sky for the rest of my life. No, dude, you deal with it. It's going to rain. All right. You right. learn how to deal with disruption. And, and now um, uh, Hong Kong has this uh, new problem where I think China wants to push a, a sedition uh, law. Sedition. Security what, law what's the, right? law? the national yeah. security law. Yeah. Well, what's that like? What, 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 is, what are the juice, so juicy details of the law? Basically, first of all, right now, what, if you ask me what's going on, to me, it's regardless of whatever the law is, it's just bad timing. All right. Let's just, let's just conclude that this is just bad timing. It's kind of like saying, you know, uh, the host of a comedy show comes on, right? Talks to the crowd and everything. And it says, all right, guys, I'm just the host, right? I'm just going to get one comedian up after another and then enjoy the <laughs> show. First comedian comes on. It's all right. Second comedian comes on, kind of bombs a bit, right? Third comedian comes on, and then like this terrible, like just turns the crowd against the whole show. And then, then the, the host comes on and says, all right, guys, you know what? We're not going to have other comedians do. I'm going to do the headline to set now. It's like, no, I didn't come to watch you, okay? I came to watch these comedians. You're just the host. You're just trying to, you know, we know you exist. That's fine. We know this is your club, but, you know, stop making it you only. And the problem is that people came, the agreement was we're here to watch these, these, these comedians. But the host just comes on and just takes over and says, you know what? I'm going to take over. This is not funny to me, so I'm going to tell you what's funny now. And on mm. top of that, to then add and say, oh, by the way, we're going to introduce a new law at this comedy club, which says you have to laugh. All right? Uh. You can't heckle. You can't <laughs> boo. You have to laugh at everything I say. All right? Oh, and man. then you're going to not only laugh, you're going to enjoy it. It's like, if anything, I'm not going to enjoy it even more now. Even more. So, yeah, even more so. It's like you're forcing me. Like, how about just you do your set and just leave me alone? No, and now mm. I have to also tell you how great you are. So there's a lot of this, you know, where number one, the one country, two system is what Hong Kong was all about. As in, you know, we, we, we all know we're part of China. We get it. But the idea is that we're benefiting from the two systems mentality. So right. we should not have China or mainland Chinese authorities interfering in our legislation or our way of life, right? Mm -hmm. No one's saying that, oh, we're not from China. Huh? This is a different, change the map. We're not doing that. We're simply just saying we're part of it. But the agreement was two systems, right? So what's happening now is because the Hong Kong government has been so incompetent that they couldn't do their part of the job. And China was growing impatient. Mm. Now, unfortunately, China wants to get what they want to get done, but it must be through the Hong Kong government now because Carrie Lam is really deaf, tone deaf to the whole <laughs> society of Hong Kong. Unfortunately, right. like, it, it, it's obvious that like when one million people yes. come out and you can just say, yeah, I see you and I ignore you, it really tells you. It just sets the bar. Like, mm. yeah, she's not going to listen at all. We're doing peaceful ways. She won't listen. Fine. You know, you're going to radicalize peaceful people very soon at this rate. And what's happened is the moment China introduces this legislation, it breaks down the whole one country, two system agreement, yes. which is not just for Hong Kong. It's a global thing. The whole world treats Hong Kong different from the rest of mainland China because of this agreement. And if mm. China's going to break this rule, it's going to hurt Hong Kong. It's going to hurt China. It's going to hurt everybody. But mm. why are they breaking this rule? Because Hong Kong government is incompetent. And I'm guessing that the Chinese authorities don't want to let the Hong Kong government step down because, you know, lose face. And thirdly, it's the impatience. So it's just bad timing, really. 
You know, wow. I mean, look, mm. the show's going down, you know, you're losing the crowd. And instead of coming up and saying, you better laugh now, right? You listen to me. I'm the owner of the club. You better laugh. You know, you're all wrong. Maybe kind of say, hey, guys, you know what? We're going to take a little short break. Let's recap a little bit. Mm. Everyone go get a drink. We'll come back and, you know, we'll settle it a bit and we'll get back all over again. You start the show again after 20 minutes with a little short break. You get new comedians in the lineup. The host maybe, you know, does something different and then you, you might win the crowd again. Right. Uh, do, you, do you think this is like a, a kind of like a distraction play? Like, uh, for example, like they are doing this so that the Hong Kong people forget that the, uh, the anti-extradition law has, has, it's still there. It's still a problem. It has not been solved no, it's yet. Been, it's been withdrawn. So technically that's gone. But that's right. only one of the five demands that has, has grown from the protest. Oh, See, what happened okay. was on the 9th of June, we only had one demand. All right. Yes. Withdraw the bill. That's it. Yes. yes the yes. government ignored it. And then on the 16th, uh, of June onwards, things started to change because there was a lot of police brutality and stuff like that. So it became from one demand to five, right? And mm. what we find is that things like universal suffrage, which is promised in the basic law for all Hong Kongers, has still not been implemented. You that know? is and crazy, along, you know. That is so yeah. crazy, Vivek, because when you, we were having a, lot, a long WhatsApp conversation, conversation about it, then you, you told me that uh, Hong Kong, the people in Hong Kong don't have universal suffrage. And that's crazy to me. Yeah. That, that, that is insane because I thought naively that almost everyone in the world has a right to vote. I think that's what everybody thinks. Or at least you see people voting and you think, yeah, okay, people are voting. But remember, voting could also be rigged in the way it's a formality, right? right. You know, it's kind of like when you have these AGMs and the, all the members come and vote <laughs> for the director. You're like, well, yes, technically yes. no one's going to vote against me, so I win anyway. But it's just a formality, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? You just have to say I was voted into this thing. Now, in Hong Kong, we technically, we don't have a vote, as in we can't vote for the chief executive, but there are like these little, uh, I forget what they call functional constituencies that can vote for it. It's really bizarre. It's like 1,200 right. people represent 7.6 million people in Hong Kong, right? That's it's, like, it's ridiculous. Is it like the electoral college system in uh, the US? In a weird way, yeah. So like certain yeah. representations, you know, this functional constituency, like this business sector will have a certain number of votes for the chief executive, yeah, yeah, yeah. but... They don't represent me. I can't influence them, you know. So it's really, really weird. But the idea is that we're supposed to have, number one, anyone should be able to run for chief executive as long as yeah. the post requirements, you know. But that's not even the case. It must be approved <laughs> by Beijing, stuff like that. You know, so it's like, you know, you're, you're going against the basic law that you're trying to uphold yourself. And then you're telling us that we're breaking the law. So it's uh. a bizarre double take, you know, where on one hand you're doing this, but on the other hand you're doing that. So it's kind of like you're, you're telling me that I'm not funny on stage or I'm using hacky material, like I'm not original, but you're doing a whole hack set where I'm like, you literally stole this other guy's whole set. And you still weren't funny either. So how is that better than me? You know? Oh, okay. man. It's, 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 it's so wonderful how all these big seismic events that are happening in the world are also replicated in small bits on stage by comedy in the comedy scene. Oh, of course. Full on, man. I mean, like comedy club owners, you know, managers, uh, the hosts, the headliners, people going over time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a right? that's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other video. Uh, um, you know, in, in Malaysia, voting irregularity is also a, a big thing. You know, like um, okay. So in Malaysia, what we do is during general elections, elections we vote for um at the federal level, we, we vote for members of parliament. Yeah. Right. So there are two hundred and twenty seats in parliament. So whoever wins. 112 seats, which party wins 112 seats forms uh, the government. So th there's a huge, a long history of gerrymandering in Malaysia. Like for example, in the urban areas where most people tend to vote for the opposition or rather the, uh, or against the Barisan National, the uh, long-standing regime, uh, one constituency can have 100,000 people. 100,000 voters, okay? So, and that's for one seat. Whereas in the rural areas, uh, one seat can represent 5,000 seats, 5,000 uh, voters, 10,000 voters. So it, essentially, we are losing out to one seat in, uh, in the urban area is worth three seats or four seats in the rural areas. And it's very hard to fight. It's, it's rigged, essentially. Our votes yeah, so don't the carry system, the same way. Exactly. Yeah, so it, it's essentially the same thing. The system itself is where it's kind of rigged and you're like saying, no, we have a system. I'm like, yeah, I know we have a system, but it's rigged, you know? Mm. Yeah, so all that put together, I mean, again, it comes back to the world of comedy. When you have a show 
and all the audience is the friend of one comedian on the lineup. And that comedian <laughs> comes up and they're killing. Right. And the owner is like, see, that guy's funny. I'm like, no, he's not. He had all his friends there. Right. That's why his stuff was funny. They weren't even laughing at his jokes. They were just cheering him on. All right. It doesn't work that way. Well, you know what? Get more friends. I'm like, you know, actually, I'd rather perform to real people and fans rather than like knock on doors and say, uncle, come and laugh for my show. I don't want to do uh, that. Vivek is, no. spilling, Vivek is spilling tea all over, man. Carrie Lamb, <laughs> comedy yeah, scene. Everywhere. Yeah, after it was, it was good talking, man. I'm going to have to throw away my mic up for evidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, okay, so now what do you think is going to happen in the future? I mean, I, I, I see last week there were protests, I mean, fresh protests in Hong Kong. Uh, yeah. But it, and then now Donald Trump's getting into it like, oh, you know, China is bad, but I also like China, or whatever. So what, what's going to happen in the future? Like, I think honestly what's happening right now is that it's the, from the beginning we had this if we burn, you burn with us mentality with the protests. Because it was basically the idea that, okay, in Hong Kong, we, we, we want to win with dignity, right? We, we love competition and we love winning. But if, let's say, I run a 100-meter dash with you, right? And we run. And halfway through, you trip over and I win the, the race. I, I still get the trophy. But, you know, as a Hong Kong, you're like, I didn't really win. You know, I want to win wow. you know, and be like, I won. I beat you fair and square. I want that pride, that, you know, bragging rights. So what's happening now is that in the beginning, Hong Kong's system has been so rigged against, especially the people who are you know, underprivileged or whatever, that number one, you're forced in schools and they force you to, let's say, not speak in Cantonese, right? You must speak in Mandarin in school. And, you know, it wow. goes against our culture or wow. you're being forced to, you know, do certain things. You know, and people are like, this is not what Hong Kong is about. You know, you're trying to rig the system for your benefit. You mm. know, the, you've got the, the wealth disparity where, you know, you, people are richer than before, poorer than before. People can't afford housing. Right, the government's not listening. The bill basically was a great example of government's ignorance to the people. So it just added up. Where you know you don't let us pick our leader, and then yet you tell us we must love you know what we're being given. You know it doesn't work that way. So it's, right. it's just a matter of like people are like you know what if you're gonna ruin Hong Kong, then you know what let's ruin it for everyone, not just us. You're gonna end it for everybody, and mm. that's basically what it is. There's a lot of discussion now with the whole one country two systems being gone, especially now with, with China's actions. And there's a whole bunch of people saying. Great. Let's do it. You're trying to break oh. Hong Kong, right? Let's destroy it. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, w- what really fascinates me about the whole protest in Hong Kong was that um, the, the tenacity of the Hong Kong people was, I, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, to have such big protests and then again and again and again and again, uh, it went on till December or January. Am I right? Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, like it, it kept going on. On 1st of January, we had like... What, a, a, I think 800,000 people on the streets again. My God. Something like that. Yeah, it was ridiculous. And first of January, first day I was there, you know, walking on the streets. And I was like, my goodness, this is the way we start our new year. Thank you. Thank you, government. This is <laughs> how, how you waste our first of Jan. What fuels the Hong Kong people? Like, I've never seen anything like it. What, what makes them go, okay, this weekend we're going to protest. Next weekend we're going to protest. And then the week after we're going to protest. Because like in Malaysia, after such a big protest, like birthday two, three, four, and five, the next day, people need to take a break, man. <laughs> they need to chill, you know? And, and, and it takes a lot of energy to, to organize the next one, which is like, which, which could be months from now. But you guys do it every week. How, I think, what, what's the ecosystem like? I would really say it's like that Hong Kong, Hong Kong mentality. Like, we really mm. have that can-do spirit. And I always say, like, you know, you, you have people working, you know, 10, 12 hours a day and they still can ah. go home and handle this and do that. We'll go for a hike and you know, all that stuff. And it's just that we're just used to it, you know, it, the, the idea of efficiency. I think also Hong Kong being smaller, you know, we save a lot of time on the traveling. So when I tell you to go from point A to point B, it's like maximum by car, maybe one hour. So I know that within an hour, I can get that done. And while I'm on the bus or whatever, I'm on my phone doing my work and everything. And it's, it's just part of life. You know, no one's saying like, oh, man, I need to just sit down, you know, just chill out. It's, it's just everyone around you. So again, it's like when you go to the gym and everyone's really working out hard, you kind of feel motivated. Like, I, I need to work out hard, man. I do this, mm. right? Again, when everyone else on the comedy show is killing, you kind of feel like I mm. need to step up my game, man. And I think the good thing is that the Hong Kong mentality has always been like, you step up your game, otherwise you're going to fall behind easily. We're so right. competitive yes, yes. that if you exactly. don't grab it, I'm going to grab it. And that energy is there, right? And then people kind of feel like one day is not one day. That's like a whole week to me. I could do a lot more. If I right. just, just save this one day. So I think that's the energy that's always been there. And also the anger. I think really the anger has been stirred mm. up so much that people are just fueling on the adrenaline and anger that they have towards the issues right, right now. 
uh, even though I don't, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time in Hong Kong. Uh, I love Hong Kong. I go there every <laughs> every year or more than once a year. Uh, what is fascinating is that how uh, I get the Hong Kong spirit uh, from just hanging out with you. Uh, I remember, <laughs> I remember when we we would do shows in Melbourne, right, at the Melbourne Comedy Festival. And fuck, man, every day if I hang out with you, it's like, let's go here, let's go there, let's go to the gym, let's go and get groceries. Like, like you have the five, Hong Kong walking speed, remember? Yeah, Hong you Kong have, walking you have speed. like five different things to do in a span of one hour. And somehow, if I follow you, we get it done. Uh, it's not fun, <laughs> but things are, get done, right? I remember we were touring with, we did a tour with, uh, <laughs> with Rishi. And then one day, <laughs> one day, and, and because I was hanging out with you so often, right? I didn't realize this until Rishi, another comedian from Singapore, also a Cindy like Vivek, by the way, if you're listening. Uh, Rishi just texted me on the side and said, because we're, we're supposed to meet you somewhere. And then uh, Rishi is like, hey, bro, let's just relax and just walk like normal. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, yeah, man, because we're, with Vivek around, it, 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 our walking speed is two times normal. Like we are, we are shoving people by the by the side. The Hong Kong walking speed. <laughs> and then listen, remember remember my whole thing with going to the beach or seeing a beautiful sea scenery oh, God, and everything. That's you know? so fucking funny, man. I think like, that's a, like, a, such a I Hong think, Kong thing. Okay, so. To explain to everyone, this is me, right? When I go travel, I'm not a big sightseeing guy. I like eating and everything, but I'm not going to be like, oh, let's look at the ocean. Wow, right? The other time, remember, we went on Great Ocean Road. Was that it, right? We yeah. drove there and I'm looking at the ocean and I'm okay, like, let me right, explain. Right. So let yeah. me explain, right? So the Great Ocean Road is a great, it's a very nice, uh, the best ocean view road you will ever find in the world. That's why it's called the Great Ocean Road. So I research where to go, where to stay, I researched, I re- researched and uh, rented the car. I drove all the way. It was one and a half hours. We reached this place called Lorn. It has be- uh, wonderful food. So I, we all get out. And after one and a half hours of driving, it's very nice to see a wonderful beach. And this fucking Vivek looks at the beach and he says, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? I get it. I mean, like, look. I see it. I see the sky. It's beautiful. It's blue. I, I, I get it. It's blue. All right. I've, I've absorbed the information and the experience in a short span of time. I didn't need to stand there like, you know, like Titanic and be like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling no. the wind blowing my thing. I'm not, you know, writing no. a Stephen King novel. I'm just saying. Let's I, okay, get back and do some work. We got to make some yeah. money. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. The money is one aspect, but also I'm like, okay, so what I, I saw it. Like, what am I supposed to? <laughs> Like, what is there for me to do? What is the processing? I always tell you, like, I'm at the beach, like, what, what's, so, so what's right. the action? What, what am I doing with this? What, what, what's happening here? Are we looking? Okay, I've seen it. <laughs> I looked. Right? Are we? <laughs> and then, no, remember the hand the motion? Moment? The hand motion? What? And I'm like, hand, I no, 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 Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 the hand motion. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, okay, tell me. So, what am I supposed to do with this? So, this was in 2015, right? Yeah. And then uh, 2018 or whatever, we, we go back to Melbourne Comedy Festival. Uh, we go on a day trip again to uh, Mornington in Victoria, <laughs> right? And this time, Vivek spends a longer time at the beach. You know why? Because Vivek has brought on his one-man production house <laughs> on his back. Okay? He has a gimbal, he has a GoPro, he has a tripod, whatever. Battery, power bank. Now he's walking up and down the beach taking videos, GoPro videos and 360 videos non-stop. He doesn't stop walking. You know why? Because now he's doing something at the beach. Yeah. Instead, of just, instead of just looking, why not create content so that people can enjoy and get likes and subscribes and shares? Yeah, because Jason, we got five senses. I, I want to use all five. <laughs> I don't want to use only one. At most, my nose is two, but I mean, I'm not licking the beach. I heard the beach. Yeah. Right? I touched the beach. What more now, right? So I need to do five things to use it the most. I mean, are you denying yeah. your senses? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, like, so I kind of get the Hong Kong spirit. And I remember one story which you told me, uh, not story, it's an anecdote about how Hong Kongers are. Can you, you remember the anecdote about the, the, the customer and the, uh, the bowl of noodles and the, the, the meatballs? Oh, is it is the one where basically I said that you, you get in there and, oh, the, the number of meatballs, right? Yes, okay, yes. Okay. So, so the I always tell this story. Call. I always tell this story about, I always tell this story to people when I want to explain the Hong Kong spirit. <laughs> okay, so this story is actually from a comedian called Dayo Wong. He talked about fish balls. Basically, the idea was two Hong Kongers are at a fish ball stall, right? And then uh, the fish ball guy gives him one, one skewer to 
person A, fishball guy gives the skewer to person B. Now, person A has three fishballs on the skewer. Person B has four. And so person A is like, hey, how come this guy has four fishballs? What the hell, man? And the fishball guy is like, oh, I'm really sorry. I'll give you another fishball. And person A is like, no, 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 no. You don't give me one more. You take one from that guy. I want to have him <laughs> get one less, right? And so it's really bizarre. Right. This actually is a very Hong Kong thing. We're like, you know, we get in the lift and we get in before you do. We're like, yes, I beat you. Ha ha. Right. So mm. you would have thought all along that this mentality is like selfish, mean, mm. or you don't care about the next guy. And two years ago, if you told me, are uh, you think Hong Kongers are selfish? I'm like, well, yeah, to a certain extent, we are. We're really money minded. We're all about winning the game. But one year ago, if you asked me that, I'm like, no, man, we're mm. we're selfish. But when we need to, oh, we'll step up to the plate. Like we're yeah. not, we want to play the game with honor, right? We want to beat you. Like I said, we beat you with dignity. So that's pretty bizarre. But yeah, that's totally a Hong Kong thing. And, and it's a very like, I want to make sure I don't lose out. But when I do, I don't want to win. I want you to lose with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and like what you said about, the, the, about Hong Kong stepping up, that is so true, man. Like uh, it, it's amazing how sometimes like, you know, people always say uh, Malaysians don't care. Uh, Malaysians are apathetic and yeah it, to a certain extent we are but last two, th- two years ago when we had the general election by and large most Malaysians were really tired we had political fatigue you know, we were, we, we, no, number one we didn't think that uh, the government would change we thought we were being defeated already but here's the thing so the government then announces that voting will be on a Wednesday okay Usually voting is on Monday. I mean, usually voting is on Saturday or Sunday or a Friday, right? So that people from out of other states they can come back to where they are registered to vote to vote. But the fuckers put it on Wednesday, which is kind of like, hey, come on lah, just don't bother, right? Too, yeah. Don't bother. Yeah. Even one of the one of the ministers said that uh, to those who are living overseas, you you only make up about zero point one percent of the vote. Don't get excited over it. This is, this is an actual tweet, right? So Malaysians got fucking upset, right? So they created this movement called Pulang Mengundi, which means go home and vote. So ordinary Malaysians pulled their money together and said, hey, whoever needs a bus ticket to come back and vote, this is a pool of money. We can give you one ticket. I can sponsor you a flight. I can sponsor you this, whatever. So people pull in so that other people could come back and vote. And the best part about that movement is no one said, who are you voting for? No, it doesn't matter. You just go back and vote. It was and bizarre. That, That's actually what happened in Taiwan as well. You oh, know, really? when they were Yeah, yeah, same deal. When, when, I, when I went to Taiwan, because Taiwan was watching Hong Kong, right? As a prime example of whether or not one country, two systems works and stuff. And yes. so I remember I was in Taiwan recently, sometime last year, and I was talking to some people because they were also worried about the votes and everything. And uh, they were saying, yeah, people have, you know, students have pulled money, you're crowdfunded, you know, there's some funding to encourage everyone to go home and vote, go home and vote. And because like they were using Hong Kong as an example of like, please vote because you do not want Taiwan to become the next Hong Kong kind of thing. And right. so uh, they did the same thing. And I, that's what I appreciate. You know, you, you know what I noticed is that it's the new generation that we're willing to think of these ideas to work around and bend and everything to work mm. within our means, not just complain and say, oh, the system's rigged. I'm not going to play the game. So, you know, like when you play chess with someone, mm-hmm. someone's cheating and, you know, at what we call fan toy, as in just like, flip the whole board and like, ah, oh, we're not playing anymore, <laughs> right? Okay. So the new generation isn't just about flipping the board every time. We're like, no, I will try to work around as much as I can. But if it comes to a point that you have no choice but to flip the board, I'm ready to do it. But that's not the point. You know, mm. and I think that that's what happened in Malaysia as well. And I really appreciate that because I think even in Hong Kong, people like the moment the protest started, there was like certain funds that were, that were uh-huh. designed for yeah. protesters, you know, right. like, should you get arrested? We will have, you know, yes. money for lawyers and everything. And that just showed you that you were like, people are willing to come out and say, you know what? A hundred dollars might give me, you know, a nice fancy meal over here, but you know, that yes. hundred dollars can do, it can help someone else. And you know what? I don't need that meal. I'll be fine yes. having a bowl of rice at home and I'm yeah. willing to sacrifice. And, I think that's where you see the beauty. What, I, what you will find is, right, when you really look at it from a beautiful point of view, all the protests and the struggles, when you look back, you're like, wow, it showed a beautiful side of yes. know, true humanity. Unfortunately, yep. there are some who are in power that have been, you know, they've forgotten what it's all about. You know, the typical, like, you, you forgot where you, your roots are, you know, <laughs> when you get big and stuff like that, you know, when you're exactly. hitting the big stadiums of comedy, you don't go to the mini comedy clubs, right? So those same things that when you get to that point, you forget it. So I feel that a lot of people at top have been so emperor's new clothing 
by yep. people around them that they think, no, I'm wearing a great dress, aren't I? Like, no, dude, you're an idiot. The whole world's <laughs> laughing at you, but yes, everyone yes. around you is also an idiot. So unfortunately, right. you all think you're wearing great clothes, but you're not. You're just yeah. a bunch of fools. But yeah. the system protects them. But that's mm. with every government, right? The, the, uh, the, I like that you brought up Taiwan because uh, Taiwan is also another example, like you said, of how, um, how to say not all Chinese are the same. You know what I mean? Like how yeah. uh, I talk about a, a bit in my last show, uh, two years ago, how like whenever there's a Chinese tourist who's caught uh, shitting on the floor in another country, other Chinese, like the Malaysian Chinese, Singaporean Chinese, uh, Taiwanese Chinese, and, and Hong Kongers are like, oh my God, this, we are not all the same, right? And it recently came back to light for me when the whole, during the whole COVID-19, there's the, the WHO just dismiss the reporter from Hong Kong when she wanted to ask about Taiwan's inclusion in the yeah. WHO, which is... In the dumbest way. Yeah. The dumbest oh, I can't hear you. Yeah. I, 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 can't, I, I can't hear a question. Can I repeat the question? No, no, it's okay. Let's go to the next question. You didn't hear the question. Why would not you want to listen to the question, right? Fucking asshole. No, um, not just that. Disconnect. <laughs> gets reconnected. She re-asked the question. He says, yeah, no, let's go to the next one. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Why would you dismiss it? point blank like that yeah but be smart use some diplomatic way to kind of go around it but you're like no it disconnected so you know what i think the internet's telling us <laughs> something let's just ignore it i'm like really can we do that i can't go to a comedy show all right that joke didn't work but you know what let's just cancel that joke out you know i'm yeah. killing tonight everything i say is killing it's like no it doesn't no. work that way people it's like your you you the, your joke bombs then you turn off the lights you turn off the sound then you yeah. turn off the lights and turn on the sound again uh, that didn't happen let's go on to the next joke and you in, reintroduce yourself. Like, as if you just came on stage. Like, all right. Oh, hey, guys. Well, what, hey, who, this guy knows what I'm talking about. Hey, what's this guy's name over here? You're like, did we just miss something? Did we, yeah. did we have a Malaysian voting? Why'd the lights yeah. go out? You, know? yeah, you just come back and go, like, hey, guys, my name is Jason. Again, like, as, if, as if you didn't, you yeah. didn't just come on just now. Um, so then I started reading about WHO. And, and because I was always very uh, weirded out by WHO's... Um, uh, acknowledgement that traditional Chinese medicine is like a valid form of medicine. Uh, oh. A lot of a lot of people were against. A, a lot of experts were against it, and I was like, "Yeah, why would they include it?" And it's, it has made traditional Chinese me medicine easier to defend because all you have to do is say, "Hey, WHO recognized it, so what's the deal?" Then I realized when I read more into it, I realized that yes, it has been um, a propaganda push by Beijing, um, and they sort of like helped uh, get an Ethiopian health expert who was sympathetic to China to be the director general so that, and all he had to do was say, yeah, Taiwan is not part of WHO. And then that helped their propaganda push, which is, to me, is bad for medicine as, as a whole. It, see, that's the thing. Once you throw in the politics towards it and you forget wow. the idea of what the WHO was for, then it just messes it up. And this COVID-19 has been a prime example Right. Look at Taiwan. Mm. No lockdown, minimum cases. They took care of everything because the president came out and said, look, man, I, my people come first. I'm closing the borders and everything. Let's do all the stuff. Everything WHO said you don't need to do, they did. And then look mm. at them now. Right. They wore masks. They closed borders, everything. Yes. Because the idea wasn't of like, you know, oh, everybody get lost. I don't care about you. It's like, look, we, let's take care of our own home. Sort that out. And we can then take care of everyone else. If everyone exactly. took care of their own home. Exactly. Right? Fuckingly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like your house is on fire. You don't go around like, all right, who else is on fire? All right, let me, let me help you guys out. You know, come on, visit. It's like, no, clean the kitchen first, right? Mm. Deal with the fire and then we'll, mm. let's come back and deal with this, right? And then yeah, the yeah. idea is that if everyone, like, if you live in a building, right? And you have, you have a, a pest infestation and you're wondering, you know, oh, what can we do? You know what? Everybody in the building, clean your house. Just clean your yes. house first. Yep. Then let's worry about the outer and the community exactly. and the neighborhood and changing our habits, okay? But no, the idea of like, well, you know what? You can still visit family. You can still go out. I'm like, okay, let's just, everyone take care of yourselves first, please. So there's mm. a lot of that. And I think the WHO has lost a lot of credibility through, you can see the clear politics that they're playing. So right? clear. With the ignoring it's of just, Taiwan. Yeah. And also with the whole face mask thing. Now, I know in the beginning, it was a really weird Asian thing. I mean, all along in Asia, you know, people wearing face masks wasn't as weird as, let's say, in Western countries. And I get it. It's a cultural difference. The only difference is in Hong Kong, we went through SARS. So people were extra cautious. You know, the moment COVID-19 thing happened, everyone's like, okay, I'm not messing around. I'm putting on that mask. You know, it's not doing me any real harm. At most, it's inconvenient to me. And if anything, it just safeguards everyone around me. I'm putting it on. And people mm. had it on, right? 
And it was just a matter of time when people realized, wait a second, I think these guys are onto something. Because there's also that certain arrogance of like, oh, this will never happen to us. And I can be very honest with you, even in Hong Kong, you would see a clear distinction between local locals and non-local locals. As in like, you've got the guy who's grown up in Hong Kong, whether you're right. Chinese, Indian, whatever. And they're, they, they're, they're reading local news, they're learning about local stuff, they're living in the local culture, and they're putting on the mask. They're saying, you know what? This is my home. I'll put on a mask. No big deal. Then you've got the guy who maybe is just here for business or maybe is still only kind of reading the news and watching stuff from overseas. And it's kind of like in denial where like the whole town, 80% is out masks on. You're like, nah, I'll be fine. Like you do realize a virus is the most <laughs> non-discriminating thing you can yeah. find, right? Yeah, like yeah. it doesn't even care what social status or what you know, title you have. It, exactly. it will attack you. And the, uh... the idea of like it's beneath you, it's kind of like, well, okay, you know what? This is the one time that your ego is going to get you in trouble. And yep. that's, that's humanity, right? The, uh, uh, the governor of New York said something which I really liked. He said, uh, uh, he held up a mask and he said, this mask is a sign of respect. It's a sign exactly. of respect for all the frontliners who are out there battling COVID-19 and you just walking around with no, with no mask. You're just basically, you know, you're tempting fate. And then when you go to the hospital, you're taking another bit which could have been saved if you just wore your fucking mask. Not, not to mention, you're also taking a risk. You're becoming an added risk in the hospital should mm. something happen. You know, like you're adding to the fact that, that they've got so much work and also you're adding some more elements of the virus in the hospital. And, mm. and you're very true. I mean, even in Hong Kong, the whole movement with the mask was, it's a, shi- it's a sign of etiquette, you know, where I'm wearing my mask not to protect me, but in case I have it and I don't show the symptoms, I'm protecting everyone around me. It's a sign right. of respect as well. So I think that's what we like. That's, and you can see the difference is like, I'm wearing the mask not because I'm like, hey, get away from me. It's more like I'm wearing the mask because I'm like, I don't know if I have it. And right. it would break my heart if I harmed you from it. And it's so weird and ironic that I think a few months ago, late last year, uh, Carrie Lam tried to introduce a law that says you can't wear face masks yeah. when you're in protest ridiculous right? and the, the irony is that here she is wearing a face mask right <laughs> yes but it's ironic and, and wearing it wrongly because the mask was just below her below her, she her would, nose. yeah she would it would slip down her face all the time you know it, it was basically bad again there was she also came out one time at a, at a press conference without a mask and everyone's like why aren't you wearing a mask she's like no there's no need I, even when i see my colleagues wearing a mask i tell them take it off you don't need it so she actually yeah. made that statement that she would say, if you were wearing it, I would tell you, please take it off. And her colleagues would have to take it off, you know? And I was wow. like, you see, because you couldn't get past the idea that you need to wear the mask for your protection. You were like, I, 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 because the mask is a representation of the protest. I cannot be seen wearing that. Oh, so the idea after right. the media mocked her that okay. someone who tried to ban masks is now wearing masks, the next day she took it off. And she's like, oh yeah, we, there's no real need to wear a mask. And you can see it's all ego, right? My it's all God. she oh. couldn't deal with the reality. If because anything... The- Yeah, I mean, if anything, this situation would have been a really great chance for her to kind of win everyone over. You know, had she shown true leadership and be like, all right, you know what? Putting politics aside, this is about Hong Kong. This is about leadership. Let's do it. No, the politics was still there. You know, telling telling her to close the border, she was like, no, because it was like, oh, you know, China won't like it, so we can't close the border. I'm like, you know, we're just saying close it temporarily. Let's deal Mm. with our stuff here, right? Mm. The, The medical staff went on strike for a few days. And wow. still no closing a border. And her excuse was like, but people need to eat too. I'm like, no one's saying to close it for fruits and vegetables. <laughs> we're saying human. All right. That's all we're saying to close it from. But oh again, my God. You know, no, but it's so interesting that the mask was a symbol of the protest. So she didn't dare to wear it. It's so funny. It's so I mean, funny. you could see it wasn't a direct, she didn't declare and yes, say, yes, I'm yes, not yes, wearing because yes. of the protest, but like you could see because in the exactly. protest, everyone had their mask on for protection or whatever. It was, a, it was a symbol. You would put on your mask and go out to avoid being detected, right? Yes, or yes, yes. Letting yes. people know your identity. And then the fact that she wore it. And then that day, the news, I think CNN or someone had an article, you know, a chief executive who tried to ban masks six months ago is now wearing one, probably mm. pissed her off. Right, made right, her feel right, embarrassed right. amongst her friends exactly. or whatever. And then the next day she was like, I'm not wearing a mask now. But then of course, a few days later, she's like, yeah, I, I, I don't want to die. <laughs> this, rem- back on. this reminds me of, I think after the big Bursay uh, protest that happened, so they were going to gather around for another Bursay rally. This time it was more about um, protesting against our then current, our then prime minister's uh, YMDB scandal. Oh yeah, I read about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was 2.6 billion ringgit found in his account, so there was a big, big protest. So number one, he the government made it 
made the protest illegal, okay, uh, which made people want to go even more. And then they had roadblocks around the city so that cars wouldn't go. And then, this is damn funny, okay. So, Berse, the official color of Berse is the yellow, is yellow, okay. They banned wearing yellow t shirts. <laughs> what? Yes. They banned. How petty. Yeah, it's, and it's, it, the, the people who created the Berse, uh, the Berse platform, I think they were kind of smart because they chose yellow. I think, um, there's no evidence, but I think they chose yellow because yellow is also the, uh, the color of royalty in Malaysia. Wow. Smart. Right. So, so that, so now the government is forced to say that, oh, you, you don't like yellow, is it? But yellow is royalty, you know? So, so that, that, but putting that aside, they banned yellow t-shirts. That's, that's how afraid of a symbol they were. And of course, when the day came, everyone wore yellow. Yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> the, course. the ironic, ironic thing with the Hong Kong protest is like, it's a black color, right? So oh. what was happening is that the police were targeting, especially youngsters who were wearing black t-shirts. The, once you wear a black t-shirt, they're like, oh, I got to check your bag. I'm going to pull you over. I'm going to take you aside. And, it was a weird time. It's like, I can't even wear black. There were moments where everyone was like, yeah, I don't really want to wear black because it seems like the thugs are going to come and attack. They were told, anywhere wear black, beat them up. Because in uh, July 21st last year, you know, at Yunlong area, basically the mob and the thugs came out and yes, they were I told, remember this see, horrible. yeah, black shirts, just beat horrible. them, especially youngsters, beat them. It's like, what? You can't just randomly beat people because they fit a certain profile, mm. right? But <laughs> that's what they did. And unfortunately, the government's like, oh, what about it? I mean, okay. It was a fight. What about it? It's like, right. really? Are you that blind? So I know what you mean. And, and it, it just shows the parallel pettiness of like, you're at that level. You have all these titles, all these names and credentials and everything. And yet you're worried that someone wore yellow. Really? And there, again, there's no proof, right? But I, 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 it's hard to see it as beyond a mere coincidence. But shortly after that Berse rally, where they banned the color yellow, uh, so our Najib, our then Prime Minister, visits uh, the UK and has a one-on-one with the Queen. Okay? And the Queen wore a yellow dress. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, she, she has wore yellow many times, right? Many That's times so she has British, worn man. yellow. That's so British but, passive-aggressive. Yeah, but there were seven colours of the rainbow. Why, <laughs> why did she have to choose yellow? Surely, because I guess- a, friend, a friend of mine who does political advising... Uh, he said that it can't be a coincidence because the queen is yeah. advised by, by her Absolutely. advisors on every single uh, person of state that comes visit her. So, but, but man, that's hilarious, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, clearly, like, a queen receiving someone else, like another country's leader and stuff, clearly you have to have all the protocols or all the information ready. Yeah. You can't be an embarrassing. Like, I didn't, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. There's no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Whoopsie. There's none of that, you know? Yeah. So definitely. But again, this is a smart way to play the game. Right? Like I never said I did it on purpose, but you interpret it that way. Right. Exactly. That's yeah. Once you, the game, yeah. it's like, it's no you. problem. Not mine. <laughs> oh man. Uh, it's, it's so sad. So, so recently in Malaysia, we had a, a coup, like a change of government. Um, several uh, members of parliament jump ship to uh, another uh, another party. So now um, the narrative is the bad guys uh, are back in power, which is very sad. Um, yeah, because you uh, were all hopeful a couple of years ago. I remember you were telling me you were emotional about it. You were like, I can't yeah. believe this is happening. Like, I mean, I, f- I can fully understand. I mean, even in Hong Kong, if we if we got universal suffrage, I think I'd be breaking down. I'm like, I, I can't, this is happening. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this is a dream. And then now for the dream to be shattered, not because the dream has been shattered, but because the guys who were supposed to do their job are like, yeah, you know what? The guys we overthrew, <laughs> we're going to do what they did. It's like, what? Yeah, man. That is exactly how bad it is. It's so weird because like, as I mentioned, uh, Najib, uh, he kind of sacked uh, his deputy prime minister. Uh, his name is Muhyiddin. So he, Najib sacked Muhyiddin. Somehow or other, Muhyiddin allied himself with, with a former, another former prime minister got into power, betrayed that guy to, to now ally himself with the guy who sacked him in the first place. It's so... Can I just suggest, can we just ban soap operas for all politicians? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, they've clearly seen one too many soap operas and they're like, oh, wait a second, what's the twist now? No one's getting pregnant. Let me do something. It's like, really? <laughs> this is not like an end of season hook, okay? We're not trying to fight for Netflix over here, guys. Just, just do your job, okay? You, you yeah, don't need right. to fight for ratings, okay? It doesn't work that way. But I think, I think, 
everyone's probably just losing their mind with the idea that everything must go viral. How can I get my news on, you know, nine gag and everything. And these guys are just fighting for it. They're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jump ship. Oh, but you can't jump. Oh no, what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump another way. Ha ha ha. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah. Funny. Why would you do that? The, uh, when will live events come back in Hong Kong? You think? I see. It's actually happening now. I mean, there are comedy shows happening, like for example, yes. on the weekends. There are live events, but I'm the capacity so... of the room, if I remember correctly or understand correctly, is that the room can only have fifty percent capacity. So, so if jealous. you like, like my flat right now, I'm actually at one hundred percent capacity. <laughs> so uh-huh. I'm in trouble, <laughs> right? Like, right. Uh, otherwise, things are happening. I mean, people are getting back, and you still have people being cautious. Of course, sometimes you have the guys at the shows who won't wear masks and everything. And look, at the end of the day, you know, there's only so much you can do. Uh, but the live events are happening. Are people in the mood for it? It really is hard to say. You know, like right. uh, if I said I'm going to do my own comedy show, people will still come. But clearly there's going to be a bunch of people going like, yeah, maybe I'll yeah. wait it out a little bit more. You know, I don't really want to be next to this guy. I, I, I mean, I, was, I, had a, I had a joke that I do now where in our cinemas, we have alternate rows, right? So like, you know, the row in front of you is empty. The row behind you is empty. But the guy next to you is right next to you. Right? But there's, no, <laughs> there's no space. And I was like, yeah, because we all know the virus only goes north and south, right? Not east and west, right? Which is ironic because the virus actually travels from east to west around the world. So why are you trying to stop <laughs> north and south more than yeah. east and west? You know, I was like, no, this is I think it's right. because if you sneeze and cough, it's one direction. It's down. Uh, yeah. You don't, you don't enough, sneeze to your left. <laughs> but we're, we're assuming my projection of sneezing is only right. one row away. Like, have you seen you have the never video? seen yeah. me sneeze. Have you seen the video where like uh, they they demonstrate how the particles spread when you cough? Oh or yeah, sneeze? yeah, 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 it's yeah. like to, with the without a mask and stuff. Yeah, 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 it exactly. It's the whole room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and also there there are some examples of like with a mask, without a mask. You know how much it can block. So even with a mask, it's not exactly like you know super safe, but it's it, it reduces the particle, uh, the distance it can travel. So yeah, mm. it, it's it, things are happening. People are coming back to life and I'm everything so, here. But I'm so it's jealous, still man. Caution. I saw, I, 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 saw, I, saw you. I saw Garen's post where he was doing, a, is it, it's called The Riff, right? Yeah, The Riff is the comedy club in Hong oh, Kong. Oh man, just to see someone standing in front of people holding yeah. a microphone. I, I've not held a microphone since uh, end, of, end, of, end of February actually. So it's March, April, wow. May, almost three months of not wow. doing live so comedy. weird. It yeah, feel like 10 years ago, right? When you first yeah. started, like, oh my God, I'm doing the gig again, you know? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's really weird. And then I think uh, New Zealand is coming back. And New Zealand has uh, actual comedy shows now. Um, but what, that, what has happened is, uh, because after talking to you, you're doing your live stream shows, Richie's doing your live stream shows. Man, I did a live stream uh, last Friday, Friday night. I got like, at the peak, I was like 1.3K viewers, a thousand viewers. Watching simultaneously. Yeah, watching, it's like, Ooh. I thought I would get, if I get, if I had a hundred, I'd be really happy. I had a thousand and three, which means that, like I said, you know, I, I always say that this crisis has made people, uh, our captive audience. They are not all at home. We just need to grab them. And that, yeah. that has manifested in a way that I never thought it would, it would be so big. A thousand, I mean, three hundred people. Think about it. The one good thing is that when we go to open mic and we do a joke and there's no response, we're going to be pretty used to it now. Like when there's no laughter, my camera doesn't giggle. So I'm okay <laughs> yeah. with it. So like Fast, uh, Faka Fast from Singapore mentioned uh, that uh, the last stream, the last live show we did for Crack House Comedy Club, uh, he's, he, he did a joke and then uh, because there's no laughter, he got thrown off a little bit. Then he started saying that, hey, you know, this is a bit weird, but Remember back in the day when we used to do open mics and no one laughed, you know? So this is kind of like that. And it's, we have been here before. So this yeah. is okay. So it, and, and adding to that, Riza Vengeza also said that, yes, now it's a different form, right? Do, doing jokes in front of a camera and you don't have people laughing at you. But at the end of the day, if you are a professional, if you are a comedian, that will not bother you because all you have to do is just tell the joke. Doing live yeah. with people in front of you is actually harder. Once you can do that, it, doing in front of the camera it won't, be, it won't, won't be as hard. So it's all about mentality. Yeah. That's why I feel that we comedians have an edge because we can present. We know how to tell jokes. Absolutely. I mean, like, I have a, I, that's where Hong Kong has a benefit because our, our, our walls are so thin. When I tell the joke, <laughs> I actually still get laughter from my neighbor. So that works for me. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, but man. honestly, you know what I do right now is that when I'm performing, let's say like now I'm looking into the camera, I'm visually seeing an audience inside my camera. And I'm trying to do it that way to kind of give myself the oh. feeling of like, I'm really performing to real people. Otherwise, you know, no matter how you do it, you're still going to kind of go like, oh, I'm talking to a camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so, you do a little yeah. bit of visualization. Yeah, what I do is, uh, you can't see now, but so on my screen, uh, on my screen when there's a Facebook Live, you know, there's comments. Right, so I position my camera just next to the comment, so it's as if I'm talking to them. <laughs> yeah, like they are looking at me. So I, so so that I'm I, there is a two way connection here. I'm talking, I'm looking at you, and you are looking at me through the camera. <laughs> so it's like I'm, it's so it's not weird. Yeah, exactly. It, it it works out. It works out. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> uh, this has been uh, too long. Fuck, how long have you been talking? <laughs> like an hour um, or something, man. Yeah, uh, it's been great talking to you, Viv. Um, I want to do this more often. And uh, we have so much to talk about, like uh, comedy, politics, the business of comedy, how the scene has grown and uh, so much more. So anyway, uh, that's all for next time. Thanks, Viv. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Pleasure. Uh, anything you want to plug? I, I, I want you to plug your live stream shows. I think they're really great. You should do more, yeah. uh, can, you should do more English live streams. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, if you guys want to check out my live shows and you speak Cantonese, just go on to facebook.com slash funny Vivek and the letter M, uh, M for mother. The reason is because someone else took funny Vivek somehow before me. I took this years ago, but whatever. So check me out over there. I do live shows, uh, just entertaining shows, really. Uh, then every now and then I'll do an English show. But so check out my page. Follow me on Instagram at funny Vivek. I'll be having shows. Uh, in Hong Kong if you're here in town. Otherwise, there's also a podcast I'm doing with another comedian called Andy Curtin called Ho Ho Hong Kong. So check that out if you're bored in the car and you're tired of hearing Jason Leung's voice. All right. Thanks, fucker. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you stop recording? I'm feeling the video will be damn.